Every evening, a dramatic show takes place at the border between Pakistan and India. It's an over-the-top display of strength and nationalism from both sides. But while this showdown is mostly ceremonial, the animosity between these two nuclear-armed countries is very real. A lot of this bitter rivalry can be traced back to when Pakistan and India were still united under British rule. Back to this moment. For nearly 200 years, the people of India lived under British rule. At the time, dominant religious groups in the country included Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs. The British colonized this large nation through a policy of divide and rule that pitted these religious groups against each other. The strategy was that Indians would be busy fighting each other instead of British imperial rule. But after decades of violence and oppression by the British, people found a reason to come together, a movement for independence. The British responded with brutality and violence, but eventually the movement for independence led to a decision that would create a political rift between Hindus and Muslims. Britain passed the Government of India Act of 1935. It gave Indian provinces a new political structure while still under the authority of the British Crown. The act set up local governments with dedicated seats for representatives from religious groups, including Hindus who got general seats, along with Sikhs and Muslims or Mohammedan. Hindus and Muslims in particular had been at odds at other points in British India's history, but the act created even more division through assigned seats for religious groups. It was all part of the British divide and rule strategy. In the resulting elections, a Hindu majority party called the Indian National Congress was led by Jawaharlal Nehru. Another party, the All India Muslim League, was led by Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Nehru and Congress won over 700 legislative seats, while Jinnah and the Muslim League only won 106. The majority of Muslims voted for other smaller parties rather than aligning with a national political identity. Without majority representation in the new governments, Jinnah worried that the Muslim population was increasingly vulnerable to oppression by Hindu leadership. And his fears weren't entirely unfounded. Violence against Muslims had broken out in some parts of the country. Jinnah expressed his concerns in a speech to the Muslim League. We are now, therefore, very apprehensive and can trust nobody. This was a striking turn for a man who had once been an ambassador for Hindu-Muslim unity. Just 20 years earlier, Jinnah dismissed the concern that Muslims could become a minority in what might become a Hindu state, as a bogey put before you by your enemies to frighten you from cooperation with Hindus. But by 1945, especially after the defeat in elections, he shifted focus. Jinnah called for an independent nation of Pakistan, in which Muslims would be in the majority. He warned a united India meant slavery for Muslims. The Muslims insisted on their demand for their own separate state and complete independence from the Hindu majority. This time, Muslims rallied around Jinnah's new focus on Pakistan and his call for direct action, where he asked for Muslims to strike and to show unity in their demand for an independent state. But a rally in Calcutta, which was home to both Hindus and Muslims, turned violent. Thousands of people died in what is known as the Great Calcutta Killings of 1946. In this atmosphere of civil unrest, Britain announced their withdrawal from India. And it fell to this man, Lord Mountbatten, the Viceroy of India, to broker a deal between Nehru and Jinnah, and to organize Britain's exit from India. It was at this moment that these men agreed to the partition of India along religious lines. Jinnah would get Pakistan, the new nation that he believed would protect Muslims from oppression. Nehru, fearing more religious violence in India, agreed to the plan. He agrees to the partition of colonial India into two separate religious states. Pakistan, with 100 million Muslims, is created as a counterpart to India with 300 million Hindus. A British lawyer named Cyril Radcliffe, who had never been to India, 
was given less than 40 days to draw up the new borders based on outdated maps and census data. Ratcliffe kept the region with the Muslim League's political base in India instead of including it within Pakistan's borders. And his borders left most economic centers like Delhi, Bombay, and Calcutta within India, leaving the future Pakistan at an economic disadvantage. To make matters worse, the British unexpectedly moved the date of their exit up by 10 months. They said it was important to get the two countries launched and on their way, because the longer you keep them hanging about, the greater the difficulties that arise. But behind the scenes, Britain had been battered in the Second World War, and no longer had the resources to continue its control over India. And so Britain rushed out of India and finally gave them independence, which meant that this moment, one that was supposed to ease the tensions between Muslims and Hindus, was actually a botched handover of power. On this historic day, when India takes her place as a free and independent dominion in the British Commonwealth of Nations, I send you all my greetings and heartfelt wishes. Millions of Indians, led by Prime Minister Nehru, celebrated the independence of this great nation. Led by Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the new dominion of Pakistan also celebrated its independence on August 15, 1947. It marked the origins of India and Pakistan with horrific bloodshed. The partition of India led to violent riots and mass migration along the newly created borders. Fearing religious persecution, many Muslims fled to Pakistan while Hindus and Sikhs moved across the border to India, but many never made it to their destinations. In the trail of murder and arson come the refugees. Their suffering is the new tragedy of India. Carrying their few possessions, they flee from savagery and butchery that has never been exceeded even in India's stormy history. About one million people died and over 14 million were displaced. Most of the bloodshed happened here in Punjab and Bengal, where the new border cut through provinces that were home to Muslims, Hindus, and Sikhs. And another province, Kashmir, which fell on the border, became the center of a different conflict a dispute over ownership that would define the rivalry between the two nations for decades to come. Already the province of Kashmir is in dispute. India is trying to hold down by force what she managed to grab by fraud. The present hostilities originated with large-scale infiltrations of armed personnel from Pakistan. If they have any idea of taking a chunk of my territory in East Pakistan, this will mean war. <laughs> Indians have uh, gone down a plane uh, which had no capability of uh, doing anything in self-defense. It's a barbaric act. This is an idea that will return the damage done by terrorists with interest. Do we need to think that if this escalates from here, where will it go? The rivalry between India and Pakistan has persisted for over 70 years. But it's important to remember where it all began. A British strategy that was designed to create a religious divide between people of one nation. So this was an incredibly complex story for us to try and cover in nine minutes. The animosity between Hindus and Muslims actually predates the British Empire. But for this story, we really wanted to cover how religious divisions became politically defined under British rule. And also in this video, I mentioned Kashmir as being a major point of conflict that came out of the partition of India. We didn't go very in depth into it in this video at all, but my colleague Sam Ellis made a great episode of Vox Atlas that dives deep into Kashmir specifically. So be sure to check that out.